And so if we look back and look at law enforcement as it relates back to slavery and the black codes, I mean, I could go on and on about how history repeats itself if we do not try to change it. Latin school. <laughs> and I thought that that was the child's thing in the world. Was I so wrong? <laughs> Race is a theme that has colored much of the Obie and Bessie award-winning playwrights' work. The Boston Public Schools integrated in 1855. One, two, three, and four. We're moving out into 1973. Court order, desegregation plan on the books. Panic in the city. I've been working for many years on um, the subject matter of dialogue about race, um, about charged issues that are not spoken. Um, trying to break the silences uh, with performance. January 74, mobilize volunteers. Have a press conference. Put a little number on the screen. Call this number if you'd like to know where your kids are going to school. We got 10,000 phone calls in a week. In order to construct the play, Ms. McCauley and her ensemble of actors went out into the field of Boston's neighborhoods and suburbs and conducted extensive interviews with residents who served as, in her words, witnesses to the busing crisis. They supplied their testimonies from bone-chilling tales of school children being bussed into unfriendly territory, to the anger of parents who felt betrayed by the system, to teachers who found themselves dangerously caught in the middle. The next thing I know, someone comes to the door <coughs> and says, Listen, we've taken over the building. I'll watch your class. The interviews are, again, subjective. We had guidelines. We had, you know, the same series of questions that each actor had that we wanted to kind of get in with each witness. But, of course, it depended on the interviewer and the witness, there, according to how, um, how they connected. I'm the principal. He had been appointed. There is so much of the truth of the last 20 years in the experiences of the people who underwent it, not the media types who reported it, not the politicians who used the situation. Uh, I think the people who had the experience did the most growing. They weren't ready to work with a group like ours. Ruth Batson, an educator and historian who rose from being a housewife to the executive director of METCO, a suburban busing program for inner city students, served as a witness for turf. Boston at that time was a place that everybody thought was wonderful. So many people think that Anthony Lucas's book, Common Ground, is the Bible, you know, about this period. And I was dismayed when I read his book and found that we were missing. We were either missing or we were passive or we had no activity. And I think that black parents saved this city. And so um, I wanted to see what this um, dramatic version would do and how it would look. So I was very interested in doing it and being involved with it. I would like to make a complaint about the schools. Now, the conditions that these kids are going in. We, we have. Uh uh, an NAACP school committee. Mm -hmm. Her words, like so many other personal stories, are clearly sung throughout the play. ...to get into college and raise scholarships. That was the craziest thing. She used exactly the right term. It's a term I always use, too, is turf. And I think with the South Boston group, it is really a question of turf. When I would go out there with kids um, to the South Boston High School, people would yell at us and say, this is our school. You don't belong here. And what they were saying is, this is ours. It doesn't belong to anybody. And I remember once being at a meeting where parents were mad because of all the violence that was going on. And uh, this woman got up and said, we want our kids out of South Boston. We don't want them to go there. Why did they send them there? Let's take them out. And this woman way in the back, sitting with her son, got up. She said, isn't this America? 
said, uh, just got off the phone now. There is a woman that says the things I said. Then she does this fantastic dance all over the, 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 you know, the stage. And somebody said to me afterwards, Ruth, I bet you didn't know you could dance like that. That came the story of my life. I didn't go to college until I was quite old. They have a perspective on what Boston is and how to survive in it. That's, uh, I think, going to be the savior of what remains of the Boston neighborhoods. The style of turf is performance theater. The tempo is jazzy. The sets are a mixture of technology and steel. The language is rich and gritty and real. The performances are strikingly familiar. From Tom, a South Boston resident, part of a family of three generations of firemen. Now, educational-wise, you don't have to be the smartest man in the world to become a fireman. To Tez, a young black man experiencing the indignations of growing up in a color-conscious society. Where I should live, you can take Roxbury, Dorchester, and Montana. And Kristen, a Charlestown mother who's only defending her turf. You look for a school and you look for a church. We listen to the rhythms of people and what people are saying behind their words in the same way that you do music. So it's a rather, um, it's a rather artistic concept, but it's very practical. You know, we're not trying to do just politics and dialogue, and we're not trying to do just pure art. We're actually trying to make those work together. Ultimately, this play, like the others in the trilogy, and like much of Macaulay's work, is about more than busing. It's about race, and it's about relationships. It's about communication, and it's about silence. It's about the past, present, and future, and the human dialogue that can link us together or tear us apart. But the cops did a lot to incite the problem. I think it's obvious that people have to um, re reflect back in order to move forward. I mean, in, in, it sounds like a cliche because it's true. I mean, that's what cliches is, are. You know, cliches are the truth over and over again. And so you have to know the past in order to move forward. And when the play ended, there were many in the audience who wanted to lend their voices to this tapestry of experience by dredging up their memories and taking part in a contemporary discourse which could lead to future understanding. Played in the same street, croquet or football or snowball fights or anything like that. It was always the street as far as you could see in either direction. Strictly a geographical neighborhood, by the way. We hated each other otherwise. You have a stereotype. If you live in that neighborhood and, and you are that race, that's the way you are. The audiences seem to welcome the dialogue, uh, welcome talking at the end of the piece. Um, people have told us how much they appreciate the work. All sides, or both sides, or whatever sides, are still hurting. And I still, I still the worst for all of these kinds of, of uh, hurting each other and doing, and it doesn't seem as if it's going to stop. Each one is grabbing and holding and not understanding that if we all work together, everybody can have. I grew up around black people all my life, you know. Turf has been performed in the South End, Charlestown, Dorchester, and South Boston over this past month at various community theaters, speaking to the grassroots nature of this effort. The producers, the Cambridge-based arts company, felt that it was important to keep the work close to the communities which generated it. And when we return, a discussion on black women on the silver screen. for years now to sell to the world what could be considered an isolated vision of life in America. Some may even go so far as to call it a kind of propaganda. The earliest Hollywood films featuring African Americans usually contain stereotypes showing blacks mostly as servants or ne'er-do-wells. Black women were often portrayed as loose women or bossy and emasculating. While many of those stereotypes are easily recognizable now, 
new stereotypes of African-American women have taken their place. And you can see these new versions of the old images in movies, sitcoms, and even in the music videos. Many observers feel that even on TV shows and movies where most of the writers are black, negative images are still portrayed. Joining me now to discuss the negative images of African-American women presented on screen and how it affects us are Dr. Ann Ashmore Hudson. She is a clinical psychologist and Brenda Brathwaite. She is the principal at the Brooks Middle School in Lincoln. Dr. Ashmore Hudson, let me ask you first, what exactly are some of the negative images that we see on the TV shows and sitcoms? And be specific, if you will. There are just a number of them. You don't have to limit yourself to TV sitcoms. You can also just look at the music videos, and that's what's um, the images of women in general, and black women in particular, are also images in which women are subservient. But if you talk about TV sitcoms, the ones that come quickest to mind are in Living Awanda in, in Living Color and Shanene um, on Martin. Both um, characters are men, in fact, dressed up as women. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. And what is it that you see negative about these portrayals? Well, if you see them, what if you see them? I don't think you had that question very long. Um, what you have is is a caricature of a person, and what you ha in a caricature you emphasize the negative qualities that make that not a person, but whatever happens to them is something that they deserve. If you, if you don't choose a Shanene or you don't choose a Wanda as a mate or as a desirable person or whatever pratfall happens, it's like she deserves it because she's such a disgusting, repulsive person as a woman. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is as women we need to understand and you have to also consider what, I what message are you saying about what black women are like? Well, let me ask Mrs. Uh, Brathwaite, what kind of message does that send to school-age kids? You're a principal at the Brooks Middle School in Lincoln. Uh, how do you see this affecting the young people that come through the school? I think it has a very demoralizing effect on the images that they have of themselves. They internalize the message, and um, young people are still shaping their identity. I think Daniel Shaw said recently that television is the arbiter of identity, and um, it just makes a very negative picture for young people who are still developing and growing as human beings. As uh, potential mothers, future mothers, and uh, people who watch television, what can we do to make sure that we recognize these images and to make sure that we don't internalize that type of behavior? Well, Dr. Think, Ash, go ahead. I think one of the things that we need to do is to look very closely at the images, to examine them, to discuss them, to talk about ways to intervene, to be more proactive rather than just accept the images as they're presented on television. Mm -hmm. To Dr. work Ashmore also Hudson? closely with community organizations, teachers, and parent groups to neutralize these images and to give feedback to those individuals who are producing those images. One of the things you can, you, you can do is begin to look at things critically. I have a, a teenage son, I have a 14-year-old son, and he, he's a little tired probably of me saying, but we might begin to say, what is it that you're looking at and to question it as you do it? Developing critical viewing and listening skills is very, very important. If you just listen to music, try to find one music, one song, that does not talk about love or sex. Just try to listen to the radio and see how many songs you can find that don't have sex or, or love in it someplace, but mostly sex. Mm -hmm. If you begin to look at television, you can make a statement. The, the thing about sitcoms is that when they're funny, they're funny and they engage you and pull you in with the humor but it is degrading humor and mm. you're laughing at yourself but at the same time you're getting a message that this is a less than valuable person okay. and it works on your psychic at the same time that you're laughing. Um, I might add to, to let the audience know that both Dr. Ann Ashmore Hudson and Brenda Brathwaite are members of the Boston chapter of the Lynx Incorporated and we want to let you know that the Boston chapter of the Lynx Incorporated will be holding a seminar on Friday April 2nd called 
Aunt Jemima to attorney Claire Huxtable, images of African-American women on screen where they're going to be discussing some of these issues. That time is from 6.30 to 8.30. And for more information, you can call 617-566-6411. That's 617-566-6411. Thank you both for joining us today. And when we return, a look at African-Americans in the field of medicine. It instantly compares. Americans have made major contributions to the field of medicine for years. Now there's a photo exhibit and calendar called The Power From Within that profiles 13 African American health professionals and their contributions to medicine. That collection was shown in Boston at the BU School of Medicine a few weeks ago. So he sent him down the street to NIH, where Lou Jones grabbed a bunch of bottles and flasks and, and stoppers and stuff. The exhibit is a series of images, photographs of uh, 13 African American healthcare providers uh, throughout the country uh, who are struggling with some of the more serious problems uh, as it relates to health of African Americans. Dr. Kenneth Edelin sponsored the photographic exhibit at Boston University Medical School. It was his hope that these images would leave a long lasting impression with both students and colleagues. The purpose of having the exhibit uh, here today is to build bridges and to break down walls. Uh, I want people within this medical center complex to appreciate and to know the contributions of African American physicians and scientists and other healthcare providers uh, to the field of medicine and other fields of healthcare. But we've also invited the community from outside of this institution to come in today because I feel very strongly that we as an institution need to begin to break down walls between us and our neighbors uh, and the community that surround us. So we've invited the neighborhood health center physicians and administrators to come. We've invited local black physicians to come in. We've invited a, a, a broad spectrum, if you will, of our neighbors to come into this institution to enjoy this exhibit with us, to hear about some of the programs that we're doing, and so that we become better neighbors, one with each other. Visitors to the exhibit would see photos like that of Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who in 1893 in Chicago performed the first successful recorded open heart operation in history. And Dr. Kim Williams, who today is director of nuclear cardiology at the University of Chicago. Dr. James Gavin III, the first African-American president of the American Diabetes Association is in the exhibit too and was a special guest at the reception. Not only are there African-Americans making contributions in medicine, but there are African-Americans who are making contributions in broad areas of medicine. Doctors don't have to do just one thing. There are major contributions being made in the area of medical practice. There are contributions being made in the area of medical research the design of new techniques, new procedures of healthcare delivery. There are many ways in which people who are medically trained can employ their talents for the betterment of the human condition, both within our communities and without our communities. And our young people need to understand that, that this is a career option, but it's a career option that has many avenues of opportunity available once you're in the profession of medicine. Other medical professionals profiled are Carol Wallace Connor, an emergency room nurse at the Milwaukee County Medical Complex. She received her nursing degree at age 38. And Dr. Jocelyn Elders, formerly director of the Arkansas Department of Health, now serving as Surgeon General in the Clinton administration. Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Alvin Poussant is featured as well. get something on the background here. The Power Within photographic exhibit was commissioned by the Aetna Life and Casualty Company. Commercial photographer Lou Jones was asked to take the photos. To develop a style like this was an evolutionary process. Um, we shoot full frame, this is what it's called, so, and we showed that by showing the black line around the photograph. So I light people from the side, I light them dramatically. I try not to do very much, to do much in filling in the shadow areas. And that's where the style comes from. 
it's a, a labor of love that we came about on the project and doing the calendar the, uh... in a way that was less formal, less uh, staid than the normal corporation expects because this is the culture that I come from of people who have really made something of themselves. They're, they're doctors, they're real role models, they're people who are in a, in a sort of romantic way saving lives. So it was a really wonderful project to meet these people, first of all, then to be, have the privilege of photographing them and hopefully making a statement that transcended just their outward persona. You can own an autographed copy of The Power Within. We have 50 of these calendars to give away, signed by photographer Lou Jones. So make sure you call us Monday morning at 433-4214, after 9 a.m., not before, at 617-433-4214. That's it. Join us again next week for more of CityLine. Bye-bye.